All right, so we just had dinner, and we were we kept having to like stop ourselves from talking about this because we didn't want to we didn't want to get too deep into it. There's we a lot to there. Save it for the podcast, yeah. Um, and I'm super excited. I read this book maybe three years ago, and it blew my mind then, and I think it blew my mind even more this time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, super excited to get into it. Me too. All right. Well. I was thinking we could start by just um, just talking a little bit about the history of the experiments and also just laying out what exactly happened to the experiments. I mean, the, I think the interesting things is going to be when we talk about the, the implications of the experiments and why Milgram thinks people acted the way they do, but maybe we can at least try to be scientific and just talk about what happened, and then we can look at the, the why. Yeah, and I think he an interesting thing about this book. You know, I I think this is one of the more famous psychological experiments that people sort of mention in passing. The the mushroom or the the uh, marshmallow test, another mm. one, the yeah. Stanford experiment. So we all kind of generally know, but the way he lays it out, much like you know a scientific paper, was was really helpful. Totally. So tell the listeners. Well, so the experiments, uh, the famous. Milgram shock experiments or obedience experiments uh, took place in 1961 and 62. And uh, this book that we read uh, is written like over 10 years later. And yeah, in uh, 1974. So, and a lot of people I was telling about this podcast were like, oh, I didn't know it was a book. Hmm. Um, so he details the experiments, exactly what happened, as well as giving some of his own thoughts and insights um into yeah kind of the his motivations for the experiments what this can tell us about human nature what implications it might have and so forth yeah it's really brilliant the way he does it and i was tech when i was texting you when we read this you read the experiments you kind of think that's what it's going to be and then mm -hmm. there's this whole other aspect of the book of him sort of answering all the questions you have when you think about this thing yeah um that's a whole different sort of second part of the book so it's a it's a quick read um and it's fun to bounce between more narrative form and then kind of the data piece of it totally well and i also found it interesting kind of like his motivation for the experiments mm. um i was learning a little bit about his life and he he was i believe a graduate student at harvard under solomon ash who did the famous ash conformity experiments mm. which were basically um just real quickly they're basically an experiment to see how much people would conform to what the group did so in that experiment uh they would have one subject come in and everybody else in the room would be like a paid actor. So you'd have like mm. five um, actors and then one subject who they were actually doing the experiment on. And then all of them would be asked a simple question like which one of these lines is longer. Mm -mm, and right. the, the subject, the one they were studying, would answer last after everybody else in the room gave the wrong answer and you know it's a very basic question you like see these lines and one of them is clearly longer than the other but after having everybody else say oh yeah a a a a it gets to that person and you know what ash found was more often than not people would comply or conform to the group totally um and that's an example of how this you know, the theories here are true, even when morality and pain isn't even a part of it. Mm. Um, but just when a, a group or an authority goes a certain way. Yeah, that, that one is nuts. Yeah, it's really crazy. And I think you, I'm not sure if you can watch those online. You can definitely watch the ones that, that we, uh, mm -hmm. this experiment online, which was, was really fascinating too. But so, uh, so Milgram kind of already had some of these ideas rocking around in his head. So that's one of the things motivating him to do the the shock experiments. And then the other thing he says at this in this book, kind of his existential questions for the experiment, um, these were kind of some of the things that he was trying to answer with these. Uh, he says, quote, how do civilized human beings participate in collective inhumane acts? How is genocide enacted so systematically and efficiently and how do the perpetrators of genocide live with themselves? 
And so this was happening in the 60s uh, around the time some of the uh, some of the Nazis involved in the Holocaust were going to trial. Mm-hmm. And so this was like a very pertinent question then. He was kind of not only saying like, okay, how is how is genocide being able to be carried out? But like, how is it being carried out that like efficiently hmm. and like at such a, such a scale? Totally. It, yeah. It's a very interesting time in history because it was, you know, kind of 30-ish years after. Hmm. And you do have, you know, the sciences and psychology is much more evolved and then they're sort of recovering from this world shattering event. What an interesting time to yeah. be studying that. And then also in the context of looking forward to the Vietnam War, which he talks about a little bit at the oh, end. Right. And napalm. And so the, these new technologies of killing people at mass scale, um, you know, what better question to be asking at that time? Totally. Well, yeah, and I think it helps kind of take it out of like, okay, this isn't just somebody in their ivory tower you know, trying to see what happens in this experiments. Like, I, I think all this stuff obviously has real world implications. Mm. And throughout this book, he kind of will tie the experiments and the findings of the experiments to, you know, what is happening politically or what is happening at the societal level. Yep. Um, and this yeah. the book has to get tied to the Nazi issue. Like, it's so mm. commonly compared and it comes up throughout the book but I think it's also important he says at the end and we can get into it it's not about that it's about humans proclivity to follow authority no matter how small right um and you know sure we all have the capacity for potentially egregious acts yeah yeah and I guess just one more small part of that since we're kind of talking about him I guess uh Milgram's mother and father were from eastern Europe and uh, mm. We're Jewish, so I think kind of in the background of his mind too was like, "Hey, if if they hadn't uh, immigrated to America, like it's very likely that they would have, you know, died in the Holocaust as right. well." So he had kind of maybe a, a personal relationship to that question as well. Huge. Um. So maybe we could talk about the experiment, and Let's he go. actually uh, lays out the experiment uh, on page three of this book. So I'm just going to read exactly what he wrote. Like you said, I think this experiment has kind of trickled into popular culture. A lot of people are going to be familiar, but just to get everybody up to speed, I'm just going to read uh, exactly what Milgram wrote happened in these experiments. All right, so, quote, two people come to a psychology laboratory to take part in a study of memory and learning. One of them is designated as a teacher and the other a learner. The experimenter explains that the study is concerned with the effects of punishment on learning. The learning is conducted into a room, excuse me, the learner is conducted into a room seated in a chair, his arms strapped to prevent excessive movement and an electrode attached to his wrist. He is told that he is to learn lists of word pairs. Whenever he makes an error, he will receive an electric shock of increasing intensity. The real focus of the experiment is the teacher. After watching the learner being strapped into place, he is taken into the main experimental room and seated before an impressive shock generator. Its main feature is a horizontal line of 30 switches ranging from 15 volts to 450 volts in 15 volt increments. There are also verbal designations which range from slight shock to danger severe shock. The teacher is told that he is administering the learning test to the man in the other room. When the learner responds correctly, the teacher moves on to the next item. When the other man gives an incorrect answer, the teacher is to give him an electric shock. He is to start at the lowest shock level, 15 volts, and to increase the level each time the man makes an error, going through 30 volts, 45 volts, and so on. The teacher is a genuine naive subject who has come to the laboratory to participate in the experiment. The learner or victim is an actor who actually receives no shock at all. The point of, the, ex- of ex- the experiment is to see how far a person will proceed in a concrete and measur- measurable situation in which he is ordered to in- inflict increasing pain on a protesting victim. At which point will the subject refuse to obey the experiment? Conflict arise- arises when the man receiving the shock begins to indicate that he is experiencing discomfort. 
At 75 volts, the learner grunts. At 120 volts, he complains verbally. At 150, he demands to be released from the experiment. His protests continue as the shocks escalate, growing increasingly vehement and emotional. At 285 volts, his response can only be described as an agonized scream. Observers of the experiment agree that its gripping quality is somewhat obscured in print. For the subject, the situation is not a game. Conflict is intense and obvious. On one hand, the manifest suffering of the learner presses him to quit. On the other, the experimenter, a legitimate authority to whom the subject feels some commitment, enjoins him to continue. Each time the subject hesitates to administer shock, the experimenter orders him to continue. To extricate himself from the situation, the subject must make a clear break with authority. The aim of the investigation was to find when and how people would defy authority in the face of clear of a clear moral imperative. Beautifully read. Yeah. Also, I like how there was some like background thunder during that. It definitely added to the ambiance. It shows this isn't <laughs> just light stuff. Like it, and it says observers of the experiment agree that its gripping quality is somewhat obscured in print. Like when you go through it, and particularly seeing the videos. Mm. Oh, it's awful these people are screaming and then yeah. just stop responding yeah insane which you, you can watch on youtube i think it's just called milgram documentary it's like a 40, 45 minutes where they have actual footage of the people partaking in the experiment and and yeah like i i totally agree i mean the you're hearing like this this you know it's an actor so the the voices are the screams aren't real but um, you know, to the subject, they're they're real, and you can see also how kind of conflicted a lot of these people mm. are. You know, like the sweating, they're like putting their fingers between their hair and just like biting their lip. Mm -hmm. Like you can you can see the agitation on their and faces. constantly looking at the experimenter mm. every time, and every time yeah. one of those grunts or screams would come, looking over there for validation. Um, totally just really really awful and the voltage like there's something so inhumane about this switchboard with vaults mm. the worst of which say xxx and just something about a shock it's really sort of guttural totally well and we should talk also about kind of milgram's hypothesis and like what he thought was going to happen mm -hmm. um yeah maybe we can get into yeah, that, that was now because really that's really fascinating yeah. Everyone was surprised that it went the way it did. Mm. And I don't have it in front of me, but they did research. They interviewed a bunch of people yeah. and asked how everyone, and everyone pretty much said they wouldn't go along with it. Yeah. The, yeah. They pulled people. Um, they had people come in and they pulled them on basically like, hey, if you were going to partake in this experiment, mm -hmm. like, how do you think, what do you think would happen for you? And, uh, so when they did this, not a single person said that they would go above 300 volts. And the average was like the mean was uh, 130 volts. So people thought on average when, you know, if this were me, this is what I would do. Um, and then this is what I thought was fascinating. Then they asked, they, they were trying to kind of control for like, okay, well, of course, of course people are going to have this bias to think favorably of themselves. So then they asked the question, what do you think other people would do? Like, what do you think the average other person would do? And um, when they pulled that, most people thought that other people would not go above 150. And they, other people thought that maybe 4% of the population would reach 300 volts. And one out of 1,000 would go all the way. And also, we should say Milgram was typical of these other people, too. He, he thought it, it very unlikely that anybody would go up to, like, 450 volts. Yep. And it's, you know, this goes back to we all think we're not capable of evil things. And he says, sitting back in one's armchair, it's easy to condemn the actions of the obedient subjects. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's just so easy to say on paper this thing looks so bad but it's not the 
the values it's not the morals it's that action of disobedience yeah. that people really underestimate it as being so hard so we've built it up we should should mention uh what the happened? compliance <laughs> yeah the, the obedience rate was uh 65 percent. so 65 percent of test subjects went all the way to 450 volts and i think gave three shocks shocks at 450 volts before the experimenter asked them to stop. So in other words, 65% of the people just kept going, kept going until finally the experimenter said, all right, we're done. Yep, and then an additional 12% went to the 300 volt intense shock. So mm. most people so, got yeah. really far. And that 65%, and we'll talk about the variations of the experiment, was pretty consistent. You saw that number mm. a lot yeah. in a lot of the variations. And one other number that's interesting to throw out is not one person didn't do anything. Any shocks. Which, yeah, that's really fascinating. So there wasn't one person that, you know, once they got into the experiment, once they got in the lab, they said, here's what you're going to be doing. Not one person was just like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm out, even before starting. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, going back onto the hypothesis of like how – how just wrong the average person is when thinking about whether or not they would do this. I mean, I guess this is the, you know, we we're talking earlier about the Holocaust and whatever. I mean, it's the same kind of thing of, I, you know, I could never have done that if I was the average German citizen, like I could have never been a Nazi. And it's like, well, statistically you would have. And, you know, if, if we're using, Milgram's metrics, like there's a two third, you know, the 66% chance that you would have been that person. But it's also very apparent that you would never think that you would be that person. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a pretty big disconnect. Huge disconnect and yeah. a lack of sort of self understanding. And we'll talk about why that disconnect happens, but really interesting that a characteristic of that state altered state that you're in is that you don't really see that you're in it and you don't believe that you could mm. be in it. It's, right. It really doesn't line up with self-awareness at all. Right. And there's something called, uh, I think it's called the attribution error, which mm. is like our tendency to uh, attribute what people do to their like moral character rather than attribute it to their surroundings so you know like we right. see somebody being really rude to like a waiter at a restaurant and we're like oh that person's a rude asshole as opposed to like oh I'll bet they're having a bad day mm -hmm. um and i think this is kind of similar to the attribution error in that like we think that whether or not we comply or excuse me whether or not we obey the experimenter has more to do with what kind of a person we are mm -hmm. rather than what kind of situation it is. And I think the one of the themes that runs through this whole book is that we are a lot more malleable based on our the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, and our um, relationship to that situation, to the context, mm -hmm. and to those other, you know, the authority, those other people in the room. And we and that yeah, you're right, that sense of self-worth is just way more inflated um, when put in in more challenging contexts. Totally. And sort of self-image. A, a big thing Milgram gets into, um, what he calls like the agenic state, yep. which is like there's, there's this shift that happens a lot of times when uh, somebody is receiving orders from an authority is that they stop, like, they they're no longer in this autonomous state where they're thinking, is this good or is this bad? Their new morality becomes, am I doing a good job or a bad job in the eyes of this, you know, person or, you know, government, I guess, that is asking me to do this thing. So it stops becoming become like their, their self evaluation isn't like, oh, I did this good thing or I did this bad thing. It's like, oh, I made, you know, the boss happy or I made the experimenter happy or I didn't and he and Milgram really stresses that you're it's a different state you're literally becoming a different person mm. um he says the person becomes something different from his former self um and that self-image 
turns to the authority to kind of be the confirmation of your self-image and who you think you are. And I think this also explains one of the things that was really common in the experiment was people almost inevitably would, even after the experiment, you know, when the experiment would come in kind of surprise, you're on candid camera or, you know, (laughs) that like, hey, this is actually an experiment about you to see how much you would obey. They would, a lot of people hold to the story of like, yeah, but I was just doing what they said. Mm -hmm. Like, even the idea that like, hey, you had some choice whether or not to obey. Like there was one guy, um, just to use an anecdote, and, and I, he's actually one of the people in the documentary. And you see the, you know, the people trying to explain to him like, you know, why didn't you stop? Why didn't? Mm-hmm. And he just doesn't get it. He was mm-hmm. just like, well, no, I did what they said. I just because he told me, I just did what he said. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of removal of even seeing no as an option. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it, a lot of times, these people like it just didn't even occur to them that like disobeying was Mm -hmm. on the table Mm -hmm. um they become an agent an arm like a literal limb of that experimenter or the 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 authority and it it was interesting in a lot of the the anecdotes of people that they just didn't get it you mm. know a few people were moved and even wrote later and said hey this really affected me but a lot of people like even kind of still even thought they were talking about memory test because it was it was yeah. posed as a memory test <laughs> right. um and that you know they just got so into and that's the sort of more um the greater good that they were trying to pursue they still have that front in their mind and they can't switch yeah to think that this might have been about something else right and uh one of these quotes that kind of brings that home uh quote a typical reply was i wouldn't have done it by myself i was just doing what i was told Unable to defy the authority of the exper- experimenter, they attribute it, attribute all responsibility to him. It is the old story of just doing one's duty that was heard time and time again in the defense of statements of those accused in Nuremberg, uh, meaning the Holocaust. But it would be wrong to think of it as a thin alibi concocted for the occasion. Rather, it is a fundamental mode of thinking for a great many of people once they are locked into a subordinate position in a structure of authority. The disappearance of a sense of responsibility is the most far-reaching consequence mm-hmm. of submission to authority. So I thought that was noteworthy. Is you know, it's not it's not as if these people are disingenuous when they're saying like I didn't do anything wrong. Like th- they actually, it's it's actually a pretty strong belief of like, hey, I was just following orders. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's that 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 duty piece was used a lot in in the Nuremberg trials, um, and it's you know you're not it, it's not their experiment. They didn't set this thing up. They're just you know pulling the lever. Yeah, which ties into another piece uh, that Milgram talks a little about a little bit about is this aspect of he calls it like the division of labor. So in this particular experiment, there's a division of labor in that like the experimenter is just giving orders. They're not actually giving the shocks and the subject is just giving shocks. They're not giving the order. So what tends to happen is in this division of labor, not just the subject, but both parties kind of, shun the responsibility or shove the responsibility onto the other and you know the experimenter i mean obviously in this this case it was it was uh you know an actor so he didn't say this but um you know uh milgram uses the the case of eichmann in this and the nazi trials and he's saying like okay well the the guards in the concentration camps are saying like hey i'm just following orders it's not like i'm the one you know giving orders to to kill these jews and the the officers are just saying hey i'm just giving orders it's not like i'm the one killing these jews and he's saying it's kind of a consequence that happens in the division of labor that happens in society which was sort of an inevitable evolution of humankind but you can see how when suddenly people have specialized jobs um 
you, you, you start to lose what you're really doing or the impacts of it. And you just get farther away from um, the actual act. I, mm. I mean, I think of like, you know, people who don't want to kill their cow right in front of them, but they're happy to go buy a burger. Like it, the, the farther away yeah. you get, um, the easier it is to give yourself an excuse. Right. And, you know, use like the burger e- mm-hmm. example. Yeah, it is. It is kind of that in that like, oh, well, I'm just eating the burger. It's not like I'm killing the animal. And the you know, the, the butcher could say, well, you know, I'm just killing the animals. I'm not the one eating it. Like, yep. you know, it's. Uh, you pass, yeah. pass the responsibility along. And like many things around authority, it serves as a evolutionary purpose, you know, and mm. we need to deli- division of labor to have you know the world that we've created yeah um but there's you know huge implications for it totally super fascinating the other other kind of point that i was thinking about the agenic state and maybe why we enter into it he doesn't say this but it got me thinking of um like in a sense when an individual enters this agenic state where they're kind of like checking out and you know just becoming a part of whatever this authority wants them to do it's a way it's kind of like a mental shortcut like they're they're not kind of having to do their own thinking for themselves and they're kind of like giving that to the authority in a kind of like um law of least effort kind of way like Mm -hmm. we're always looking for ways to do less work and think less because energy is expensive so One thing I was thinking about, I was recently, uh, I recently went to Italy with my parents and we did a bike tour and the, this tour was like 10 of us on these bikes and (laughs) we're, there's one tour guide who was like at the front of the pack on his bike and we're riding all around Rome and if anybody's ever been to Rome, like it's a very dangerous place to be cross the street just in general you got all these like mopeds people no offense to romans but people drive like crazy over there um so it's very dangerous and there was one point where the tour guide like went ahead under the impression that you know he was just going ahead and all of us were kind of looking out for ourselves and my mom just followed him without even looking both Mm. ways because in her mind she assumed that he was in charge and leading and would only cross the street if everybody could follow him right so it was a kind of way of her to do some like you know okay well i'm just following him i'm not actually i don't actually have to look both ways and she almost got hit by a car and i like screamed i was like mom what like jesus yeah and she was just like oh my god like sorry i just assumed that like because he crossed that I could cross. Right. So it seems to me that's part of part of what that is. It's like, okay, well, we just kind of blindly follow or blindly obey. In a sense, we are like offloading some of that cognitive mm. load onto others. And in that example, she had a job to do, which is to ride her bike and not fall off her bike. Yeah. And that was enough. <laughs> like that yeah, was all she was right. willing to muster. Yeah. And it, it is, it's it's calming. Mm. Um, and I think it's easier to almost get into a flow state in that way of like, this is my task mm-hmm. and I will do it and I'll be this part of the conveyor belt. Um, yeah, versus, and, and it's not help productive to second guess every decision that you're making. Sure. Um, you, you know, it's comforting to give that up to someone else. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I thought, and I noticed it too. I mean, there was times where I was walking around Italy with my parents where maybe one of them knew where we were going and was leading. And I would find myself like kind of checked out and not in that same headspace that I would be in if I'm just walking around a busy city by myself where I am looking out for cars. You just kind of get into that like, oh, well, I'm under this person's, you know, leadership or authority right now. I can kind of just mentally check out and they will accept responsibility for whatever happens Mm -hmm. yeah and they also they're from here they know the city they're Mm. the authority they're wearing the like roman lab coat that gives you them gives them that trust and yeah it's you know it's there as if i fall um but yeah those are all 
in a sense, not going to keep you from getting hit, hit by a car. Totally. Well, and I think that kind of similar thing is happening in this experiment when you see the, um, you know, almost like the subject hiding behind the experimenter. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just them. I'm, I'm just following orders. Absolutely. So there was that tendency to, uh, you know, shove the responsibility onto the experimenter. But there's also a tendency to shove the responsibility onto the victim, which is another uh, super tragic, super tragic, but um, nonetheless fascinating aspect of this in that, you know, after a lot of people complied, they would blame the victim of, oh, he was so stubborn or he was so stupid to get all those words wrong. Um, and there's a huge depersonalization element there, right? And how yeah. it's really easy then to vilify that person in some way, see them as stupid, um, and see in group, out group. You and the experimenter are the head honchos. This person is somehow less than. And I think that that less than component, that's when you start getting into genocide territory, right? Like when you can think of someone as less mm. than human, um, you know, all bets are off totally and he uh, milgram talks about that a little bit and you know when we're looking at okay well what was different than from this experiment to the holocaust i mean one of the big ones is milgram says okay well in the holocaust there was like a 10-year propaganda campaign to yep. de to demonize and dehumanize the jewish people um so that made it a lot easier for the average german citizen to to um you know, to inflict uh, harm onto the Jewish people. Um, but one really interesting aspect that he gets into here is it was as if after they, after these subjects had already inflicted harm onto this innocent guy, that they felt a need to blame him in order to kind of relieve themselves of some of this guilt hmm. so it's kind of one of the things i was thinking it's kind of a chicken and egg situation in that like you know we could we could say all right well the the reason that we're able to you know harm people is because we have dehumanized them but you can also hmm. flip it and say we dehumanize people because we already have harmed them um, to make ourselves feel better. To make ourselves feel better, exactly. So in this, on this point, he says, of considerable interest, however, is the fact that many subjects harshly devalue the victim as a consequence of acting against him. Such comments as, he was so stupid and stubborn, he deserved to get shocked, were mm -hmm. common. Once having acted against the victim, these subjects found it necessary to view him as an unworthy individual whose punishment was made inevitable by his own deficiencies of intellect and character. And the, you know, the 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 uncomfortable laughter comes to mind too, mm. that this becomes kind of a, it, yeah, you're looking, when faced with something painful, you're, you're grasping at anything to make yourself feel better. Um, and it, these sort of more sadistic elements become apparent. Right. Yeah, and it seems like a yeah a response to relieving oneself of the guilt, and I can kind of think of it on like a personal level, and then maybe on like a more societal level. So, like on a personal level, I can relate to maybe treating somebody poorly in a relationship who wasn't deserving of it, and then finding myself kind of looking for reasons to victimize them. To kind of, oh, well, they deserved it because of this, this, and this. Um, totally. So I can relate to it there. But also I was reading, uh, I actually read recently this book on critical race theory. And there was an idea in this book that kind of maps onto that. Um, they say, quote, materialists point out that conquering nations universally demonize their subjects to feel better about exploiting them. So that, for example, planters and ranchers in Texas and the Southwest circulated notions of Mexican inferiority mm. 
at roughly the same period that they found it necessary to take over Mexican lands or later to import Mexican people for backbreaking labor. And that idea kind of blew my mind. I mean, because in that way, they're kind of saying, okay, well, dehumanization doesn't exist naturally. It's, mm-hmm. it's like, like they exploit somebody and then for their own like selfish motive and then find a way of justifying it by then kind of creating like a negative stereotype. And I, I think it sort of has to happen that way. You, mm. I, I, I find it hard to believe people are really thinking, okay, I'm going to get this benefit. I'm going to explode down the road. What can I do now to set myself up for that? Sure. You can see how so naturally you, you need the benefit. You want the positive outcome. And then your mind needs to tell you a story about it afterwards. I just find it so interesting, like kind of that chicken and egg situation. Exactly. Because it's like, do we harm people because we have dehumanized them or do we dehumanize people because we have harmed them? Right. And it's a feedback loop. Once you've done that, it becomes so much easier to continue doing it. Totally. Should we talk about some of the variations? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were wild. And I think I was excited as we headed into so so they really just set up. All right, let's look at this experiment a bunch of different ways. Mm. What if it's only women participants? What if we do it in different locations? And you really see overall that there's not much change. Mm. Um, There's a few to call out. I think the ones that popped out at me are, you know, those that were really lower were um, when the experimenter was absent. So that person, the experimenter wasn't in the room anymore. And then when the subject chose the shock level themselves, they got to pick how much they administered. You saw that really go down. Mm. Um, But he probably did, what, 20 different variations? Yeah, there were a lot of different variations. Um, yeah, like you said, that when the experimenter, so they did one where basically the experiment, like experimenter, like made up some excuse. So I've got to leave to go check on this thing, but continue doing this experiment in my absence. And uh, so the experimenter was giving the orders on a phone mm-hmm. rather than in person. And that was one where it actually dropped pretty significantly. It went from 65% total obedience to 20 percent Mm-hmm. and i mean just that made me think about a lot of things i mean how often when the teacher isn't looking at you when your boss isn't mm-hmm. breathing down your neck is it easier to not do your job um and i mean sort of sadistically it makes me also realize hey if you if you want someone to do something you better stick around yeah um because it, yeah, out of sight, out of mind, and it, it's easier. And maybe that's the authority agentic state too. Is the agentic state was severed when that person isn't right there, being a part of your body. Yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely it. And there's there's less chance of kind of getting caught. So one of the other interesting things happened when they did this variation is a lot of the s- subjects gave a less intense shock than they were Mm -hmm. supposed to. Mm -hmm. So like you're supposed to go up by what, like 15 volts every time they get the answer wrong. A lot of them would just keep administering like the lower level shocks. Yep. Which is also interesting uh, because one thing Milgram says over and over throughout this book is it isn't sadism that is motivating these uh, subjects to obey. It's not like as if we have this, you know, unconscious need or desire to see others suffer and that like if given the chance, we'll just kind of gleefully do it. It's like, you know, when people got to decide for their own, like you mentioned, like what level of shock, they would always do the lowest one Mm -hmm. or like even this, they would even uh, kind of tamper with the experiment in order to give them a lower shock. Right. And in that way, this experiment isn't about our capacity to be evil. Yeah. It's our capacity to do what we're told and throw everything out out the window. It really always comes back to that authority. And interesting because you get start to get into a cycle there because now they're they're lying mm. to follow the rules of the experiment or that are actually immoral. Like there's just immorality <laughs> like cycles yeah. around this or the folks that sort of gave a hint like they would either you know give this give the 
victim <laughs> a mm-hmm. hint or you know say words louder to really give them a leg oh, up right. like yeah. there's this just sort of circular nature of them trying to help um yeah weird. totally and and that also kind of uh discredits anybody because one of the kind of justifications some of the subjects gave after they had administered the the shocks was oh well i was just trying to like better science and like i you know i just want to wanted to kind of increase humanity's understanding and in being part of this experiment i was going to help with that um but that kind of falls apart when you find that okay well subjects were willing to kind of cheat in the experiment in order to not as not cause as much yep. suffering but they you know at, at least at that point weren't um stopping the experiment they were just tampering with it yep and the only thing that is more painful than hearing that subject's cries is disobeying the authority and when that authority and that just i mean he goes into that at the end it's wild when that authority is removed a little like in the other room Mm. that pain becomes less um and the victim's pain becomes stronger totally yeah so that that was an interesting component there's also one that stuck out to me was uh the variation with the proximity of the subject to the victim yep so like we said in the classic experiment, the victim being shocked is in the other room um, and not visible to the subject who is shocking them. But they did this a few different ways. So one of them was uh, they put the victim in the same room a few feet away and it went down to 40% obedience, which is a pretty significant jump. And then the lowest was when the subject actually had to touch the victim to shock the victim themselves. Uh, Obedience went down to 30%. That's just gruesome to imagine. They really have to put their hand on it. Um, And I think shows the power of different senses and really touching someone Mm. and how that sort of breaks a genetic state. But And there's also a more... You are taking a far more active... Role. totally yeah you're not able to kind of deny because mm-hmm. when somebody's in the other room it's like oh, okay well, i'm not looking at them i can just kind of forget that there's somebody yeah. suffering over there when you're actually they're right next yeah. to you um and it's wild like Mil- milgram says like we didn't think we were gonna have to do all these variations like <laughs> yeah. you can see him kind of being like well geez what are we going to need to do now to, to see if someone yeah. will stop yeah. and it gone all the way to what what if he holds his hand on the pain yeah and this made me think of so there's a famous which i'm sure you've heard of the the um kind of thought experiment in philosophy called the trolley experiment mm-hmm. where it's basically like all right if there's a train coming down a track and it's about to hit and kill five people and you are in a position where you can pull a lever and it will the train will then go on a different course and kill one person like would you do it mm-hmm. and for this phrasing of the experiment most people say yes most people say yeah well yeah you're you know like you'd pull this lever and you'd kill one person versus five people dying of course but when that is framed all right, so there's a train coming down on the tracks and it's headed to kill five people and you happen to be on a bridge above the train and there's a really fat person on the on the bridge and by pushing that person off the train or excuse me off the bridge it would fall they would fall in front of the train thus stopping the train and killing the fat person but saving the other five would you do it and <laughs> i don't know ridiculous like that these you know philosophers just come up with these uh, <laughs> crazy questions but most people say no to that mm-hmm. and the, the theory is it's because like we've kind of evolved this visceral response to the act of actually pushing somebody mm-hmm. and actually you know that tactile experience of causing harm triggers a part of our brain that like flipping a switch or pulling a lever doesn't mm. And I think you could say the same thing about this experiment is like, okay, well, they're harming them, but they're just doing a little flick of the finger. 
versus actually like holding i think he said they had to like hold the hand down and shock them which yeah we just have a much more like instinctive reaction to yeah and it's like there's a a almost a a dirtiness of like dirtying your hands the blood on your hands of literally holding someone there um and being the one that if your hand wasn't there that wouldn't have happened yeah yeah and i think that was the one of the most significant uh changes like in terms of proximity to victim Mm -hmm. um the second section had some two when we add started adding other people so the two peers rebel oh yeah um so let's see they there were multiple subjects Mm -hmm. multiple people that were responsible for making the experiment happen all all of which were actors except for one and when you start to get some conversation or dissent amongst that group and there were different variations of who did what task some person just read and some person just flipped the switch um but when you when you you have a group with variation within it it was easier to start thinking in a way that you might not be obedient yeah so like you said in this one i yeah i think it was the subject plus two other subjects and these two subjects at some point would say hey i'm not partaking at this and they would go to the other side of the room and then the you know a few volts later the second one would say hey i'm not doing this go to the other side of the room it was a lot more likely that the subject who the experiment was actually on would stop and Mm -hmm. say like all right i'm done too yep and he gave a few explanations for why this happened um I mean, the obvious one is, you know, that we kind of conform to the majority. Mm -hmm. And in this way, even though the authority is telling you to continue, you now kind of have power in numbers. And there, this also goes back to his kind of more theoretical explanation of authority is like the, the reason we submit to others in sort of a hierarchical sense is so that we can operate more efficiently. Mm. And if you have dissenting opinions or variation within a group, you can't move as fast. You can't head toward a goal. You need that coherence to be effective. And once that coherence is already broken, yeah. it's easier. You're already in a chaotic state. You're not the one that's making that first chaos and kind of opening the door to say no. Totally. Well, and then just bringing this idea to like a more like a broader real world applications um i recently watched the movie uh a hidden life or the hidden Mm -hmm. life and it's about um movie by terrence malick it's about this based on a true story about this guy who was a conscientious objector in world war ii um and was just like i don't want to be a part of it at all and of course you know he was sent to prison and then later executed uh but the big thing there was it wasn't so much of a big deal that he dissented but what the nazis were afraid of was that other people would Mm -hmm. see his example and join in and then you have a serious problem on your hands so i think you know a lot of times it is the authority that is aware that okay one person you know dissenting alone isn't a really a big deal but they might cause others to yep you know to disobey as well and then you've got like a real problem on your hands yep and the louder that mob gets the more dangerous they become and the numbers for this uh so when the two peers disobeyed first uh only 10 percent of people went all the way to 450 volts so that was the most significant one I mean, you've got going from 65% to Mm -hmm. 10%. That's a huge jump. Yeah, and and his first reason for this is he says, the peers instill in the subject the idea of defying the experimenter, which goes back to what you're saying originally is they didn't even, some didn't even think that they could or that Mm. that was an option. Yeah. Um, And I think within, especially in situations in life where you're, really with low power or low socioeconomic status or any of that like often it doesn't even cross your mind that you could say no right even like a really trivial example i think of of, is like 
I don't know, like buying a hot dog at a vendor and them saying like, all right, four bucks. And it's like, no, like <laughs> I'm not going to pay four bucks for a hot dog or, you know, you like you have that option. Right. And like, I don't know, I maybe because I'm in sales, I just, I do this more than the average person, but I'll like haggle with the, the people and be like, no, yeah. like I'll give you $3, but I'm not paying fucking $4 for a hot dog. And a lot of times they'll be like, okay, three bucks. But it's like, I think a lot of people just don't even think like, no, this just is what it is. Yep. And the monetary example is great because we think of it as gold. A dollar is a dollar. Well, okay, what is a dollar? Like this, mm. these are really lacking context. And gosh, I think of traveling too. Like how many times have I been ripped off because I don't really know the price and I'm not going to, you know, fight. Question fight, it. Yeah, question someone and fight back. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I mean, it's another thing we can get into. There's a lot of reasons we don't question it. We don't want to look stupid. Yep. Like you said, if we're traveling, you know, we don't want to have that awkward situation where they're like, no, that, that is how much it costs. Like, we don't want to look like an idiot. Right. Um, and the but, other, th oh, go ahead. But if you do ask, I mean, I've also like asked, like, can I ha have this for free? Yeah. And sometimes it works. Oh, yeah. Because people just aren't used to you even asking. They don't even think it's an an option. Right. Right. And they're so just flabbergasted <laughs> by the resistance to capitalism that they give it to you. Yeah. There's some, uh, I forget, some podcast I was listening to, the guy was like, all right, your homework assignment is next time you order a coffee at Starbucks, like ask for 10% off. <laughs> and I think it's one of those things like no people just like wouldn't even think to do that. Right. But it's crazy how much how many times it actually works right right um so yeah just seeing it as being an option and then he mentions a term here i don't know if he coined this term but it's whew, it's a real sat word counter anthropomorphism mm -hmm. which here what does it mean it means <laughs> <laughs> thank you for asking <laughs> it means uh it's, quote, the phenomenon when humans treat systems of human origin as it exists mm -hmm. above and beyond any human agent, beyond the control of or whim of human feeling. The human element behind agencies and in institutions is denied. Example, when the experimenter says the experiment requires that you continue the subject feels this to be an imperative that goes beyond any mere, merely human command. And then they gave one example of, of a, one of the subjects who, you know, was t being told after he was like, hey, I don't want to continue here. And the experimenter said, well, the experiment must continue. The subject said, quote, it's got to go on. It's got to go mm. on. And then Milgram says, quote, he failed to realize that a man like himself wanted it to go on. So you're almost giving agency to the experiment, experiment. and thinking like, well, like we can't do anything. The experiment must go on. That line, the experiment requires you to continue, yeah. will be like seared into my brain <laughs> because especially after hearing it in the audio, mm. it's really, really intense. It has like a Star Wars thing <laughs> to it. Like this is, it's bigger than you. And there's there's that ideology of like, this is for science. Yeah. At a time when science, you know, this is like the space race, you know, this is this is ethics. Totally. Well, yeah, that, that was one of the lines the experimenter would use. And- and it does, it kind of takes the possibility of dissent away mm -hmm. because if if the guy were to phrase it as, I want you to continue the experiment, the guy might be like, well, fuck you, I'm not doing it. But if he goes, the experiment requires, they kind of go, oh, well, the experiment requires, that means I have to do it. The great experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy stuff. Um, Any other variations? Yeah, there were f maybe one or I two. I mean, the more. other crazy part is mm. that none of the other variations worked. Mm. What were some of the some others? Of the, yeah, so some of the ones that didn't really do much. They moved the location of the experiment from Yale to the basement, to a basement in Yale, thinking maybe it would have less kind of legitimacy in the subject's eyes. That didn't have any effect. 
And then they moved it off site to like an office building in Bridgeport. And it did dip a little bit. It went to like 48%. Enters with prior conditions. They came in like saying they had a heart condition. No real reaction. Oh, when, yeah. When the victim. Yeah. The victim said, said they had some issue. Yeah. Wild. And yeah, like you said, since I think Milgram was so stunned by what was happening in the experiments, like initially the victim didn't say anything. He was just Mm -hmm. silent behind the wall. And then like everybody was just automatically going to 450. And they were like, he was like, oh man, I need to add some stuff to see if I can slow these people down. So then he came up with the like agonizing screams and the victim saying like, stop, get me out of here. Can you imagine be the, being the, the actor preparing for their paid gig that day? Yeah. Like, what a, you know, they're thinking, I went to Juilliard for this. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah it, there's a lot of theatrics in this experiment. Mm. You think mm-hmm. of science as being sort of so sterile. And yeah. this thing is just all sorts of messy Totally, totally. And like, who made that machine and like painted on triple XX? Like, it seems too much. Well, Anne Milgram is watching the whole thing behind one way glass. And there's a movie they made out of this is really good. And actually, Jim Gaffigan plays the victim. The yeah. Kind of, Stop, get me out of here. <laughs> Which uh, is really funny. But yeah, oh, Milgram is out. watching all of this happen behind one way glass, which is pretty creepy. Super creepy. <laughs> Um, so we've kind of been talking about some of the different things, both motivating people to obey and motivating people to disobey. Mm -hmm. And I think the obvious thing is to say, all right, these people that, because there were people that stopped the experiment and maybe in a minute we can talk about some of the anecdotes Mm because they're interesting to get into. So there were some people that say, all right, time out, I'm done, I'm out. And... In terms of the motivate, what was motivating them, I think the obvious one is, you know, they were like, hey, this we're harming this person. I don't want to be a part of it. Um, but there also might have been some self-interest in stopping the experiment. I think some people were maybe fearful of some kind of retaliation from the victim and that, you know, maybe the victim's like, all right, well, I'll see you in the parking lot kind of thing. Or... Um, you know, maybe a fear of being sued. You did have some of the subjects saying like to the experimenter, like, hey, are you going to be responsible for this if this guy dies? Um, So it is possible that some of these subjects halted the experiment, not out of empathy, but out of kind of self-preservation of like, hey, like, you know, I don't, I don't want a court case or like, I don't want this guy you know, kicking my ass in the parking lot kind of thing. Huge. And he refers to them as strain. Um, And so what are the things that are causing that strain within the subject? Mm. Um, Retaliation being one, um, this, uh, the the literal cries of pain as sort of being nails on a chalkboard and just physically uncomfortable to actually listen to. Yeah. Um, We talked about self image of the subjects. It doesn't line up. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea of contradictory demands. So you have a subject telling you one thing, an experimenter telling you another. How do you kind of reconcile those things? Yep. And, you know, the strain is true whether you subject, you know, whether you disobey it or not, you're going to still going to sort of feel that discomfort. And and one of the things I thought Milgram does a great job of is he kind of thinks of everything. Mm -hmm. Because anytime there was... I was kind of like, well, maybe this was motivating them to obey or maybe this was motivating them to disobey. He would then like say it in the next paragraph. Um, yeah, we already I talked like about I like the one that's yeah. the sequential nature of action. Um, oh, yeah. that That... But if he goes on, he is reassured about his past performance. Earlier actions give rise to discomforts, which are neutralized by later ones. And the subject is implicated into the destructive behavior in a piecemeal fashion. Um, So the, you know, the farther along he goes, if he disobeys, he's now saying, hey, I've been an asshole all all along. This whole thing is Mm -hmm. a sham. And I think I can certainly relate to 
once you're caught in a lie or once you've headed in one direction, yeah. it takes a lot of courage because you're sort of negating everything that got you there. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. Right. Yeah. If you disobey at 450 volts, you're kind of implicitly saying I was wrong when I administered 300 volts. Definitely. On, on that point, too, I was kind of thinking one thing I would have liked to see, one variation I would have liked to see is would any of them have administered 450 volts right off the bat? Because mm. I wonder if part of it was this like what's called kind of like the foot in the door technique. Like they had since they started with such small and worked their way up, worked their way up that going from 350 to 375 didn't really seem like a big deal to the point where, you know, it's kind of like the metaphor. You turn the boiling pot of water up in such small increments and then you, the frog boils alive kind of thing. And that like maybe because they were just going up 15, 15, 15, it didn't actually it didn't actually feel to them like, hey, I'm about to hit this guy with 450 volts. That's a shitload of right. uh, volts. Right. Yeah, and how many movies is the plot that someone wakes up and they're having a normal day and then by the end of the day they're burying a body just because all, you know, all <laughs> yeah. these things just really start to stack up and yeah. um, you have to make it worse in order to solve the you know, whole mm. thing to begin with. Totally. Um. Anxiety was an interesting one, and he defines anxiety, an often overused term today, as vague apprehensions of the unknown. Um, and this idea that, hey, when you follow the experiment, you kind of know what's going to happen. Everything is laid out. Once you start to disobey, you don't know what's going to happen. It, it becomes this unknown, and that has a lot of you know, you can have a lot of fear associated with it. And that's yeah. where you start to get all these, you know, anxious laughter and and mm -hmm. um, all of that. And Sweating. then he ends that, and this is just double star for me. The remarkable thing is once the ice is broken through disobedience, virtually all the tension, anxiety, and fear evaporate. Um, and I, gosh, I feel that so much in life is you lead up to this thing that you don't want to say mm. and you, it ruins your life for weeks and months and you're thinking about it. And then you take that 10 second leap of bravery yep. and all of a sudden like it all really goes away. Um, but it's that first break with obedience, that first break with whatever we call it now, setting, giving boundaries or pushing back, mm -hmm. saying no. Um, that's the really hardest hump to get over. That's great. And he even calls, at one point, he says it as trivial as politeness mm -hmm. or that like initial awkwardness. Like people are so adverse to being awkward or feeling awkward that they're willing to just continue with this thing of like, it would be awkward if I told this guy no. Oh man. And I feel that so much in life. Like, Mm. That's I I would be interested to see this experiment with um, agreeable versus disagreeable sort of personality types um, and how willing people are to say no just based on who they generally are. Um, but yeah, I mean, part of submitting to an, uh, the experimenter is not just being under their control, but sort of being responsible for their emotions. Mm. And y you don't get tied to the victim's emotions. You're tied to how this person sort of feels too. And you don't want to embarrass them or oppose them or make them feel negative affect in any way right like they might not wanting to and he he calls it kind of like in a way hurt the experimenters feeling exactly so it's like okay well if i say no he, i might hurt his feelings because uh it would be like undermining his authority so he says um quote it is a curious thing that a measure of compassion on the part of the subject an unwillingness to hurt the experimenter's feelings are part of those binding forces inhibiting disobedience. And this reminded me actually of a, a short story I read a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Cat Person. I don't know if you read it. <laughs> Great it, title. It was, it was actually, I think it was in the New York Times and it kind of went viral. Um, but it was about this like young girl 
girl, not I mean, young woman who was about to like hook up with this guy that was a few years older. And there was a passage that stuck out to me that kind of reminded me of this same phenomenon. Uh, so just real quickly, I'm just going to read this paragraph. Quote, Margaret sat on the bed while Robert took off his shirt and unbuckled his pants, pulling them down to his ankles before realizing that he was still wearing his shoes and bending over to untie them. Looking at him like that, so awkwardly bent, his belly thick and soft and covered with hair, Margaret recoiled. But the thought of what it would take to stop what she had set in motion was overwhelming. It would require an amount of tact and gentleness that she felt was impossible to summon. It wasn't that she was scared he would try to force her to do something against her will, but that insisting they stop now after everything she'd done to push this forward would make her seem spoiled and capricious, as if she ordered something at a restaurant and then once the food arrived, had mm. changed her mind and sent it back. So in this case, she's talking about, you know, this woman who, you know, goes back to this guy's place and is really like, hey, I actually don't want to have sex with this guy, but it would be really awkward to stop it now after we've kind of been like flirting and teasing about it and, you know, implying that it's going to happen this whole time that, yeah, it's almost like a sense of kind of politeness and like, oh, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings, so I'm just going to go ahead with it. Right, particularly if you give mixed messages mm. or you've given a certain message in the beginning, yeah, you feel like you have to have be consistent throughout and it's hard it's hard to walk back from. Yeah, that's a that's a really good example and I mean how many people have been on dates and they have to go through the night or they have to go on a second date because they feel obligated like there's the, you know Yeah. That's a very very common trope. And it's like yeah, it's like in a sense, out of not wanting to feel awkward. Mm -hmm. Like we we don't want to feel uncomfortable or we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So, you know, in this case, we'll, you know, sleep with somebody or, you know, this happens with buying stuff. Sometimes like, you know, I work in Times Square, you'll see people just like buy the bracelet just because they feel awkward and they don't totally. want to say no. So like, all right, here's five bucks. Just stop making me feel uncomfortable. Yep. Um, or, hey, I'll do, I'll shock this guy just like, you know, whatever. Yeah, make it go away. <laughs> make it go away. In my notes, I called this doing evil in the name of politeness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's really uncomfortable to be not polite. Mm. And it's not, it's, you know, it's just so socialized. Um, it's, it does not feel good. And, and just, I mean, we walk away from any interaction and if you think someone doesn't like you or that didn't go well, it's just a little harder to sleep at night. Like it, mm. it doesn't feel good. He, I think one of my favorite quotes in this whole book is 163. Mm. The act of disobedience requires a mobilization of inner resources and their transformation beyond inner preoccupation, beyond merely polite verbal exchange into a domain of action. And the action is like the hardest part here. And then he goes on to say, the price of disobedience is a gnawing sense that one has been faithless. Even though he has chosen the morally correct action, the subject remains troubled by the disruption of the social order he brought about and cannot fully, dispe cannot fully dispel the feeling that he deserted a cause which he had pledged to support. It is he, and not the obedient subject, who experiences the burden of his action. So just wild that even in walking away from this, even the person who did the morally right thing mm. is walking away feeling worse about feeling the shitty. whole exchange <laughs> yeah. than the person who did the right thing. And it's like no good deed. Yeah. Um, that was just, wow. Yeah. I mean, that is like, man, yeah, you don't, you, like nobody's going to praise you, pat you on your back. I mean, that was in, in the movie I mentioned earlier, The um, uh, A Hidden Life, The Conscientious Objector. Mm. Like, now we kind of look at him and like, oh, what a great guy. Like, he should, uh, you know, should have a building named after him. But, like, at the time, like, 
you know, just getting spat on by like everybody in his community, going to jail, going to prison, finally being executed, his wife screaming at him, why, why are you doing this to our family? So it's like, yeah, even if you do the quote right thing, it's like, you don't really, a lot of times the, the lone dissenter is Mm. not, uh, doesn't, doesn't really get celebrated. Uh, absolutely and particularly if you're socially ostracized like if there's Mm. social ramifications for this that's you know really unlivable Mm. um um yeah do you want to get into any of these like profiles they they have some some uh kind of anecdotes of of different people and what their experiences were who are your favorites there was an old testament professor yeah he was great he was one of the people that stopped when the experimenter said, you have no other choice, sir. You must go on. He said, quote, if this were Russia, maybe, but not in America. It's a very uh, American answer. <laughs> yeah. And comes just really a sign of the times. Right. And uh, he is one to spontaneously bring up the word ethics. Um and certainly that derives from his background and his teacher, but he's the one that they really name as also being a religious person. Mm-hmm. Um, so they explain the true purpose of the experiment of him, and the experimenter asks, what is your opinion is the most effective way of strengthening resistance to inhumane authority? The subject answers, if one had as one's ultimate authority God, then it trivializes human authority. Which is interesting because he is still being obedient to authority. Something. It's just that his authority is God Almighty, not the experimenter in the lab coat. Yep, exactly. There's something, there's some sort of higher power um, which is guiding. And I mean, gosh, if that higher power has a decent sort of moral structure, then mm. that certainly can be thought to be a good thing. Um, an interesting trivializing human authority. Um, but I mean, if if there's any good part of religion, it's, you know, having someone that's greater than the king, greater than, uh, you know, the president, someone who makes makes those rules. I thought this was was powerful. And he's one of the few. They don't mention many of the well, there aren't many of them Dissenters. in this. Yeah. 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 And I think, I mean, going back to that quote we just talked about is of how hard it is to walk away having dissented. Um, Mm. It's easier so if you have some sort of a strong moral value structure that can help you sleep at night. And if that is religion, so be it. Um, But it also makes me think of, gosh, everything, you know, sort of the stoic values of have your own person, personal morals it reminds me of kind of the the ubermensch ideal of having your own personal value structure mm. um and if that if if that is more important to you than basically anything yeah. then it's going to be a lot easier to oppose others and sort of sleep at night even having pissed people off right and it kind of goes into like um a power and numbers thing in that like even though this guy is dissenting he he is not alone in that like he is you know with god in standing mm-hmm. in objection mm-hmm. to this it's kind of uh can at least for him give him that like feeling of all right it's not like i'm a alone dissenter here i'm i'm with god in in objection to yeah. what what these people are telling me what to do and there's a supersedent goal, too, of I'm also trying to, whatever it is, get into heaven, like not sin. Mm. There's the, there's a long game here yeah. that, sure, if I lose, you know, lose, if I don't, if I disobey, but there's a, you know, there's an, a final reward, so to speak. And there's a flip side because goodness knows religion ideology has been justification for also following authority and doing yeah. immoral things. Um, but this guy seems pretty staunch that that's sort of what kept him. Totally. Well, and, and on that point, uh, at the actually at the very beginning of the book, I think in the preface, um, Milgram says the idea of obedience to authority goes back, you know, centuries, millennia, and he talks about the Old Testament and the story of Abraham and Isaac, yeah. which uh, 
as most people know, is the the story where God is asking Abraham to kill his son Isaac, and <laughs> Abraham is very conflicted and is like basically like, no, I don't want to do this, and God is telling him to. It's like strangely similar to this experiment, mm-hmm. and I think the moral in that story is that like you should do what God tells you. I mean, God ultimately says, whoa, actually, don't kill him. Last second. <laughs> Last second, like, pump the brakes. But but I think the what Milgram is saying is, like, in a lot of these religions, obedience to authority, that authority being God, is thought to be a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's just that, hey, we got to be careful if this authority is asking us to do malevolent things. Right. Right. And in that way, you're separating out the sort of spiritual higher power from the institution Mm. or the humans that are kind of, you know, living that out. Um, But yeah, I mean, this if 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 nothing else, these religious texts are moral rules with which to live and and do good. Mm. Um, Or this guy was just like trying to be on his high horse after he (laughs) did a good thing. He's trying to throw it up to the big man. Yeah. Sky Daddy. The other thing that was kind of interesting psychologically that would happen is after the experiment uh, had been finished and the people would, you know, had obeyed and and shocked the victim, they would say in justification, well, yeah, but like I felt bad about it. Like they would, they would use the, their, objections or their belief that it was wrong as a justification for doing it Hmm. and milgram i mean that's interesting psychologically is that that was kind of again a way for people to kind of i guess live with themselves is like you know like oh i can sleep at night because even though i shocked this person like i knew it was wrong while i was doing it he says quote some subjects derive satisfaction from their thoughts and felt that within themselves, at least, they had been on the side of the angels. Hmm. And then he says, quote, what they failed to realize is that subjective feelings are largely irrelevant to the moral issues at hand so long as they are not transformed into action. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and you know, he brings this home. Um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he basically says, hey, it doesn't matter if you know, the Nazi concentration camp guards felt bad about what they're doing. What mattered was their actions. Right. And that's the hardest part. You know, yeah. it's easy to, to dissent, to argue and to say no. It's easy to feel uncomfortable. It's easy to um, have emotional strain and feel all sorts of hard ways. But it's really hard to do the action. Actually do the thing. Do the thing yeah. and stop it. And people even said, like, I'm going to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. But they didn't actually then carry it on. Right, right. Yeah. Um, So one of my faves is mm -hmm. Gretchen. Okay. Which one was Gretchen? She's page 84. She's the medical technician. And she's an example of someone who, like, she just has to be low in agreeableness and sort of high in conscientiousness. She was yeah. very straightforward, not very emotional about it. There's some dialogue with her, which ends with the experimenter saying, you have no choice. And she says, I think we are here on our own free will. I don't want to be responsible if he has a heart condition. If anything happens to him, please understand that. It's just like so yeah graceful and like i think who i definitely aspire to be but am not at all <laughs> um the, the woman is firm and resolute throughout she indicates in the interview that she was in no way tense or nervous and this corresponds to her controlled appearance throughout so i think there mm. also has to be some personality disposition whether socially or sure. or born but then it also says ironically gretchen grew up in to adolescence in Hitler's Germany and Mm. was for the great part of her youth exposed to Nazi propaganda. When asked about the possible influence of her background, she remarked slowly, perhaps we have seen too much pain. Beautiful. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. Which that kind of makes me think like, in a way, she had already 
participated in the experiment. I mean, obviously not at the individual mm-hmm. level, but she had seen yeah. this experiment play out um, in Nazi Germany. It kind of makes me think like, okay, if these people who are in this experiment were right. to be in an analogous experiment down the road, would they be less likely to obey? Right. Um, I tend to think yes, but as we've talked about earlier, we're pretty bad at predicting our <laughs> and capacity. Anything yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah, and, y- you know, y- we'll talk, we can talk about the ethical implications of it, but th- this thing had to impact these people's lives. Sure, um, and yeah. you see, I mean, I think in my experience traveling to Germany, although this book, he kind of says some things that don't correspond, it's a very knowledgeable historical country like Mm. my peers in germany know so much more history than than we do because they come from that and i think that there is um at least in the sort of centuries to immediately following that sort of atrocity you know you keep it really fresh in your mind Mm. um and you know the way that these folks were put on trial you know this was something that the country really really grappled with definitely well, maybe we could talk a little bit about the ethics of the experiment because that's one of the things that comes up a lot with this experiment is a few things. I mean, like, was it ethical to lie to these subjects to tell them you're being experimented on for this memory test when, in fact, they're, you know, being tested on whether or not they will obey? Um Milgram at the end, this was actually I think in the like up uh, the what's that called? Appendix? Yeah. Uh, so they, they polled people like I think a year after the experiment. It said eighty four percent said they were glad to have been in the experiment, fifteen percent were neutral, uh one point three percent indicated negative feelings. Uh four out of five people thought more experiments of this sh- this sort should be carried out, and then seventy four percent said they had learned about themselves in an important way. Mm. 74%. Yeah. That's high. Yeah. One of the things I, I th- kind of thought about is he, he mentioned a lot of times that the subjects would go home and like tell their spouse about right. this. And the spouse would, of course, have the reaction of, oh, I would never do that. Right. Um, without actually having been in the situation. So... I, I think that might be a little alienating to kind of, you know, your spouse thinking you're this monster. Yeah, and you you have to live with that and, and grapple with it. But I think, I mean, even to the, going back to the sort of person that grew up in Nazi Germany, it's easy to really quickly forget how bad things could be. Mm. And, you know, even these folks that were closer to that atrocity um, were willing to do it. And I think, um, I mean, we both laughed about this, that we don't really even care about the ethical implications because it's so damn fascinating. Um, But I think anything that brings up people's capacity for evil can only help us. You know, when we see, Mm. you know, mass shootings on the news when we see you know people doing really atrocious things saying hey that's not just an evil actor that was born evil but is there something else going on here um and so i you know i i almost think of it as a blessing that these people got to go through this thing yeah because the sooner you can can see your shadow in a union mm. sense the you know the sooner you can sort of become a more integrated person and find your best and worst qualities and go head somewhere yeah well and to kind of uh riff off of that like kind of jungian flavor of this like i kind of wonder if the people who this experiment was good for and had these kind of positive effects that they talk about were people who were maybe at a stage of maturity or psychological development where they were ready to see maybe those unpleasant negative parts of themselves that are able to do such a thing and integrate them. Hmm. And maybe the people who were less mature or less psychologically developed – 
were the people who instead of you know like this guy saying hey you know i was responsible for this and like i need to think about that i think maybe these people were the ones that are saying no no i didn't do anything wrong like mm-hmm. no no i'm 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 fine uh, it's you or or the people that just had a really hard time with it mm. and i think of like ptsd right with soldiers a lot of times isn't them seeing some gory shit a lot of times it's them uh seeing what they are capable of right and having to like live with like oh my gosh like i'm capable of killing dozens of people and not really being able to integrate that into mm-hmm. their self identity mhm so yeah i don't know i'm i'm mostly like just i think my curiosity leads me to um you know think hey this i i, I wish there were more experiments like this but um, I understand the ethical argument um, maybe in that I guess it could be damaging to somebody who is not r- quite ready to um, to uh, learn some of those truths about themselves. Mm. And I mean, I just wish there were more opportunities for us to see those glimpses mm. without hurting anyone and without sort of damaging our psyche you know if we could if we could accept that weakness as kind of a pathway to growth but it's really hard to yeah. to look at that um and to sort of know what to do with it and to not feel ashamed and embarrassed mm. it's something that needs to happen really on the individual level no one can show that to you yeah um and i think that's these folks you know after ha- after the experiment sitting down and they're you know not many of them are willing to be like yeah you, you fooled me you know like this is a great yeah, science right. experiment um totally. it's hard to come to terms with yeah crazy stuff well that was the end of my notes but i i want to keep going where there's where there's other stuff that you let's see what had we missed that I, yeah let's... i think we hit a lot of my greatest hits mm. um <laughs> let me know if you got some i got something okay what do you got all right this might be like a funny fun way to end um Mm -hmm. controls that we would have liked to see of the experiment or variations Mm. so there are a few more serious ones and less serious ones one one of the ones i would have loved to see is if like the experimenter was a woman if that would have affected Mm -hmm. um obedience rates and if the victim was a woman, if that would have exp- mm. uh, affected, like people maybe would have been less inclined to harm a woman, especially in the '60s, um, or a child, or a child. Yeah, that would I would that would be interesting. Yeah, to we'd see. be willing to see that. <laughs> we'd be willing strap to strap them up. <laughs> we'd be willing to pay for that. <laughs> yeah. um, that was one that stuck out. Uh, I already talked about this, but I yeah. would like to see personality trait differences Mm. and just in general more demographic differences and whatever psych psychographic socioeconomic differences across the board yeah me too and and see how that especially with what we know about like the the big five personality like they i feel like could be very systematic about okay these big five traits correlate with obedience Mm mm-hmm um, and he seemed to think, think that like, uh, there wasn't really a way to correlate specific traits. Um, he says, quote, I am certain that there is a complex personality basis to obedience and disobedience, but I know we have not found it. Right. The other one that I was interested in, and this is maybe just stupid, but <laughs> I would love to see like punk musicians like punk rock mm. musicians and like i would love to see like what's the guy named uh, zach de la roca from like rage against the machine right. like how he would do in this experiment like right. if he would just be like fuck you i won't do what you tell me or if he would actually you know go all the way yeah well and that's different interesting too because like there's a metal resistance to pain hardcore aspect too so would he Mm. be more desensitized to like yeah fuck (laughs) these people yeah or would he be more willing to to you know resist authority and so that's also like okay are there 
innate personality traits, but are there also professions or walks of life yeah. that would make people react differently? And then I'm sure there's variation within those things. Because um, totally. you saw like more cops and military people and people who are already submitting mm. to authority. Um, but yeah, it would be pretty cool to get some metal heads in there. Yeah. That could be like part of the audition to be in the band. Yeah. Like you have to, you have to tell the experiment to fuck off. Right. If you're going to be anti-established enough to be in this band. Biker gangs. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so cool. This was so much fun. Thank you hey. for having me. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. And, um, what are our takeaways? Yeah. Takeaways, uh, don't submit to authority unless you have a good reason don't be a pushover don't be a pushover stand up for what's good yeah all right thanks claire thank you see ya thanks for listening to unpacking ideas if you enjoyed the episode please share it with a friend or scroll down and write us a review or give us a rating all that stuff is extremely helpful so thanks for doing that in advance if you would like to get in touch with me or to hear about future podcasts that are coming up, please visit unpackingideas.com slash podcast. Uh, and there I post links to the articles and essays and books that we'll be discussing on future episodes. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for listening, and I will see you next episode.